Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to I am Become Load Balancer, owner of your network. Um, I'll do a little introduction about myself. Um, yeah, I'm Nate. I have been hacking networks since I was about 12 years old. Uh, I spent about 17 years building and troubleshooting networks. I worked for Microsoft for seven years, four of those years, or two of those years I was in the network engineering group. Um, I spent a bunch of years shipping out Windows patches for Patch Tuesday, so I'm sorry, but you know, that's what I did. Uh, <laughs> and I did a stint in Defender for Endpoints, doing some endpoint research, and uh, I'm about to start a new job on Monday that I'm not going to give away the secret just yet. Uh, I worked at F5 Networks for 10 years. Seven of those years, I was Microsoft's dedicated engineering design escalation support contact, which is where I get fun pictures like an F5 device encased in a block of ice, which we will kind of get to the, the story behind that a little bit later. Um, I like to speak at conferences. This is my first time at NorthSec. Um, I've done primarily blue team sort of defensive focused focus talks. So this is the first talk that's more on sort of offensive, like evil shenanigans thing, which I'm kind of excited for getting a little bit of feedback. Um, I, was in, uh, I was featured in Wired Magazine in 2020. I helped start a group called CTI League. We built a 1,500 person volunteer InfoSec group that was giving out free uh, threat intelligence and sort of perimeter assessments to hospitals to try to prevent them from getting ransomware during the pandemic. Um, and then my side stuff, I like to spin drum and bass music because I'm an old school techno kind of guy. Enough about me. <laughs> So um, the TLDR, for those who are maybe uninitiated, what are load balancers? Um, these are very large, expensive pieces of networking hardware. Um, they're usually deployed in what they call a failover pair. So if you think of like HSRP for routers, it's the same concept, right? You've got a device that's passing traffic. If something happens to it, you can fail over and can ideally not lose, not lose any of your um, connectivity. Um, they do layer four to layer seven load balancing. Some of them can be web application firewalls. You can do VPN, you can do DNS load balancing. Um, they're sort of like a Swiss army knife of networking um, for things that are not just your basic switching and routing. Um, they also do SSL and TLS offloading. So people will use these things when they're, the, actually F5's biggest selling point at first was you could have a very powerful SSL accelerator chip slap a certificate on it, load balance it across your pool of dozens or hundreds of servers, and save money on SSL and also be more performant than going to specific servers themselves. Uh, the nice thing about these things is because they're, so, uh, they're such a sort of a core routing and traffic shaping device, you get almost unfettered access to the internal network once you hack onto one of these devices. Um, they're generally on multiple VLANs, most of them have internet connectivity, some of them are talking to Active Directory, there may be VPN sessions, so they're a very juicy kind of fun thing once you get on it to see where you can laterally move and pivot and the other sort of maliciousness that you can perform. Um, and they're mission critical, right? These things are, you think of like your core routers, these are very important devices which are generally not updated unless someone absolutely has to. Um, F5 has had some code quality issues over the years and people who've managed them kind of get to know that if you don't need to upgrade the thing, just leave it running. So a lot of these things are running two, three, four, five, ten 10-year outdated versions of code. Uh, and the nice thing about these from the attack perspective is because they're proprietary, you don't have much in the way of EDR or endpoints so like solutions that can monitor what's going on with these devices. So um, even when we were at Microsoft, there was, we had remote logging and things like that, but there wasn't really any way you could detect if someone got on the device, at least not in any timely fashion. Um, another fun thing about it, which is we're going to get into here with these vulnerabilities, is that these devices always have a web GUI enabled. Um, the F5s in particular are Apache with Tomcat. I wish I could tell you it was updated. It's not. Um, so there's also other vendors like Citrix, um, A10, a few other companies. I'm going to be specifically talking F5 today, but the design concepts are very much the same, right? Citrix runs BSD as their management operating system. F5 runs CentOS. You can pretty much, most of what they do is identical. Um, it's just slightly different like commands and things to get around. And then they also have shells. Um, so Bash is the standard one. They have their proprietary TMSH one. I will point out that as I'm going through these slides, you're going to see TMSH commands. The reason I'm sticking them in there verbatim is because you can then plug them into the POC that came out last week uh, and run these commands. So the idea is you can copy paste and play with this stuff in a lab, which at the end we'll talk about how to build one. Um, so the deployment methodology. Um, when I was building this talk, I was initially going to use the CVE from 2020, this 5902 um, past traversal vulnerability that F5 had in June of 2020. 
that was what I was going to use to show all the demonstration stuff for you. Uh, however, they blessed me a week ago with an even more easy to exploit and an even easier to POC vulnerability that's also a CVSS 10, which essentially, without getting too deep in the weeds, um, you take a connection header, you basically stuff an authentication connection header inside the connection, like the connection colon header, feed it to the device, and it believes you now have root access to the machine. Zero authentication required, you can run any command as root, um, it's gorgeous. Um, and all devices have OO management, so they sell these things. It's generally a big networking switch. Um, they also sell VM versions of it. We're not going to go too much into the VM stuff except at the end because that's how I built the lab to show you this stuff. And I hope that's kind of readable. I mean, it's green on black. If you're not using green on black, are you really hacking things? Um, <laughs> so uh, they have an OO management interface. The hardware devices will have a switch, a bank of switch ports, and they'll have an actual like gigabit interface that people can plug into the management side. Um, they also have with these network interfaces, you generally plug them in to a trunk port. A lot of people then tag VLANs on top of them. And then because it's in a HSRP kind of design, each device will have its own non it's stick a static IP that's attached to the device, and then there's an IP that they call the floating address. Um, this is bound to the device that's passing traffic. This is where your server's default gateway will be. If the device fails over, that IP address will float over to the other device as it takes over. The thing that people don't realize, and we saw this last week when people were doing incident response, is that not only is the management GUI and SSH enabled on the management interface, every single self-IP address on the device by default will be listening on management traffic. So people may be thinking, oh, I'll just turn the management interface off and I'm safe. Well, no, every other self-IP the device has is also listening on those management ports. Um, so it makes, it, it makes locking these things down um, complex. Um, behind these things are generally pools. This is the taxonomy that F5 uses. Pools of servers, which is just your server resources. Um, this is all stuff you can look at in the config. You can kind of figure out what's back there. Most people name these pools fairly explicitly. So it's like web server pool or my active directory pool or whatever they're load balancing. So there's all sorts of juicy stuff that we may not be able to get too deep in the weeds on. The virtual servers are the actual traffic interfaces. This is the thing that's going to be facing the internet, facing the clients. This is what everybody talks to. And then it sort of just disperses traffic across the back. Um, they use these concept of profiles. Um, this isn't super relevant, but I'm trying to give you an idea. Or super, isn't super relevant to attacking them, but it's useful to know how these things operate. So they'll make a virtual server. What these things will have is a, like a layer four profile if it's going to serve, let's say it's serving TLS. It'll have a layer four profile for TCP. Then it will have a profile for HTTP because it's going to be doing HTTP traffic. Then it will have another profile for SSL, which is where the certificate and all these other details are stored. So these things have a very, it's a very kind of convoluted way of configuring them. Um, but once you start digging around, you can start to understand, okay, how is, what is this thing doing? And it's, yeah, it just takes time. Um, one of the other things to notice about these is that when they fail over, because they need to shift the layer two address that all the servers are talking to for um, their default gateway, and at the very least, um, they need to update the switch with where this layer two address is. Like they have a concept that they call Mac masquerading, where you can have a Mac address that's on the floating address. So if it fails over, the MAC address isn't going to change for the backend servers. What it is going to have to do is the switch, the CAM tables in your switch are going to have to know this MAC address changed from this port to that port. Um, so if you fail these things over by accident, you're going to get, that's going to get noticed. They're going to all of a sudden see a failover event. They may notice that traffic gets interrupted for a second. The idea here is I'm trying to teach you how to not get caught if you hack onto one of these things, and only a red teaming environment, of course. So a little bit about how these things work at the low level. Um, this is a slightly outdated slide or a slightly outdated picture. They split the things into sort of two planes. This AOM part of the graphic that you're looking at is for one of their older platforms. I don't believe the new platforms have these anymore. That was the always-on management. It was a, literally a separate CPU that ran its own separate instance of Linux that you could mess around with if you got onto it. But the really important part is there's what they call the traffic management microkernel. This is the code that F5 writes that power, the, excuse me, processes all of the traffic, it's what handles all the load balancing, it's all of the sort of brains of this device. Everything production happens there. You'll see this HMS part, this is the host management subsystem, so this is where your Linux stuff works, this is where, this is the part we're going to be attacking. Um, the other important thing, if you break TMM, if you do something that causes it to lock up, the devices will fail over and you will probably get caught. If people are paying attention, this is usually noticeable. 
Now, the management side is CentOS. Um, it's not a very updated version of CentOS. I think their most current, up-to-date code is running like CentOS 7.3, and I believe CentOS 8 is current. Some of their older platforms go all the way down to CentOS like 6.5. Um, so you can pretty much do whatever you want here. And the interesting thing about how the architecture works is when the devices boot up, at least the hardware ones, the first thing that takes over all of the resources of CPU and memory is their proprietary TMM code. Then it yields back a certain percentage back to the Linux side. So you're kind of, you're kind of protected from really going breaking anything too badly because there is a check there. It says, okay, if, this, if the, man, the Linux side uses too much CPU resources, it just stops giving it resources. So the traffic, the idea is they want to always pass traffic and never let you, you know, infinitely loop something in Linux that then takes down the whole device. Um, now, your traffic planes on these things can be tens, possibly hundreds of gigabits a second at this point. Um, this is a little bit out of order, but should you get on one of these and should you decide to start sniffing around or maybe you're just trying to capture sensitive information or some, whatever your, your sort of uh, mission in this engagement might be, um, don't put TCP dump on any of these interfaces that have TMM attached to them. If you've ever been a, a Cisco router or a switch person that's like doing a set debug all, um, you will basically be dumping 40 to 100 gigabits of traffic into TCP dump on the Linux side. That will cause TMM to lock up, the device will stop working, and you will probably get caught. Um, one of the ways to figure out what platform you're on is this is our first of the TMSH commands. If you ask it to show sys hardware, um, and I apologize that I don't have an example of it, what it looks like, it will actually tell you like what hardware platform it is, is it a virtual instance, you know, how much processing power. Um, it gives you ideas, and then you just go look it up on their website and say, okay, how big of a box am I on, right? Am I on the $2 million chassis, or am I on the like $40,000 chassis? So once you get on one of these things, um, let's say we use one of our, our fun exploits to get root, um, there's some things you need to know to not, once again, not get caught. These devices, because they're in failover pairs, use the concept of a shared configuration, right? So this is the stuff where you add your virtual servers, your server pools, your SSL things, and this is, of course, synchronized between both devices so that if it fails over, it has the same config. Um, if you change things here, there is a fairly good chance you'll get noticed. The devices are smart enough to notice when a change is made to one side, and it'll say, oh, I'm, not, I'm no longer in synchronization. And if somebody's paying attention, a big if, they may say, well, why did the devices just go out of sync in their config? Let's go take a look. As I said, changes that impact the traffic plane uh, will definitely be noticed. Um, if you start doing things like changing, if you start messing around with the load balancing configuration or trying to fiddle with the actual stuff that's serving traffic, a lot of times what will happen when you, add, when you apply the change, it sort of resets that configuration. So you may drop active sessions, you may cause a traffic interruption, like some blip that will get caught. People say, what happened to my F5? Why did it, why did it like have a blip? Um, now, if you just change stuff on a single device, there is a section of the config, as I mentioned, like the self-IPs are just for the single device. That doesn't get synchronized, and nobody really notices that, so keep that in mind. Uh, and if you don't know how these things work, if you're not familiar with the underlying tech, don't touch the traffic plane. They have this cool technology that they call iRolls, which is basically a TCLTK, modified TCLTK language which allows you to do deep packet inspection on traffic flowing through the device, and then you can manipulate and steer traffic based on like binary payloads. Um, I think I know one person in the world that's good with these things. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to mess around there, you can, but I would highly advise that you either steal their config and then set up a VM lab and try to do it, um, but it's, 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 it's there be dragons there. Um, so once you get on, uh, all of this is CentOS, right? So the logging is all in var log. Um, they do have, like I mentioned, remote logging. So this is the type of thing you, would, you can check using this exploit. You can actually say, you know, before you maybe jump on the box and start doing things, you could say, look, TMSH lists his syslog. It'll tell you if the device is doing a remote syslog. Um, if you dig further into their configuration documentation, you could, in theory, disable the remote logging before you hack onto the device and sort of pre-cover your tracks. Um, they have a proprietary, somewhat proprietary authentication system. It's based loosely on Linux PAM. Um, the only account you will ever be able to add to the Linux side is, or you won't be able to, the only account you can log in that's actually a Linux account is root. So trying to echo something into Etsy password and create a user through the add user thing, it's not going to work. They just, you can create the user, but it won't let you log in with that user. 
um, history files, you know, clearing our tracks. Uh, home user is where all your history files are created. Um, there's two of them. There's your normal bash history, and then you've got the TMSH history. Um, you need to clear out both of those if you're trying to keep people from seeing what you're doing. And let's see here. So user accounts. So if we're going to hack on to one of these devices, right, we've got this cool exploit from um, last week. The idea, because it gives you root access, you're going to need to log into this thing somehow. Now, more advanced red teamers, you may be able to spawn like a netcat reverse shell. Um, I'm not a red teamer, full disclosure, so you probably have better tricks than I do. And if you want to talk about it later, please come see me. Um, but you can create user accounts, and it will be noticed, right? If you created a user account, you'll notice that it goes from online and in sync to online and changes pending. So this is the kind of uh, visual cue that if someone's watching it, they'll notice, well, something just went differently. Um, however, because users are not a traffic serving part of the configuration, you could then just synchronize the configuration. It won't interrupt anything, and the, all of a sudden the devices will go back to being in sync, and you've created your own user, and now you can log in and do whatever you want. The advanced, the advanced shell, and I, I have an example of this coming up, when you create a user, when these user accounts are created, they give a whole bunch of different permissions, but there is an option of which shell you give them. Um, if you say, say shell none, then they can only log in via the GUI. If they say shell TMSH, then they can log in only with TMSH, which restricts command line access. You can generally feed um, bash commands through it. It has a bash option. You say, okay, just bash minus C, give it the bash command, it'll run it. But what it won't let you do is just drop to a full bash shell and start running around in the file system and doing all the, the fun, you know, evil things we like to do. Um, the other interesting thing about these devices is you can actually disable the root account. Um, at Microsoft, we did this all the time. We would basically set them up. We'd lock them down. We restricted SSH access. We turned off the root account. Um, the fun thing about this, I was testing this in my lab, is I disabled it, and then I used the exploit to check whether it was disabled, and it was like, oh, the root account is disabled. So then I used the exploit to re-enable the root account, and now I could log back in. Now. This seems like pretty cool, but keep in mind, I knew the password for the device. So if I don't know the password for the root account, my options are either change it, which now if they go to log in and it doesn't work, that's definitely a sign that something's wrong, or just you know add a user and give them bash access and then continue on with your day. But it's just it's an interesting way these management um, the management stuff that they've done. Is, is sort of convoluted, and there's so many attack paths. Uh, the vulnerability that came out in 2020, like I said, passed traversal against a Java servlet page in Tomcat that allowed you to run TMSH commands as root. This one was you know, the connection header, which hit a different, it hit the REST API that allowed you to log, run commands as root. Um, it's, it seems like we're in, in uh, Groundhog Day sometimes. The other interesting thing about it is they don't have a firewall per se. Like these things have the concept of what they call a net, um, it's a self-allow list. Let me see, I have a picture of that. So what this is, is it's essentially just a list of ports and protocols that you will allow to be accessed on the self-IP address. Um, now some of them, if it's a SSH, there is a daemon running there. If there, it is you know, TLS, there's a daemon running there. Um, if you turn on some random other port, it, may, it just means that you can talk to it on that port. Um, the fun part about this is because they're not shared, you know, and again, we can go, and, you know, if you, if you get one of these devices, you try, you see, okay, well, there's a root account, or I've created myself a new account, and then you try to SSH in, and you get a connection refused. Well, you throw the exploit payload, and you look at what the actual self-allow list is, and you're like, okay, well, SSH is disabled. Well, then you just throw the exploit payload and enable the SSH port, and now you can get back in. And this isn't shared. Nobody's going to notice unless they're paying extremely close attention. They also allow outbound connections by default. The thing, though, to keep in mind is, and the way we would deploy these in sort of the, like a really good environment is the actual device itself had no default gateway. Um, there would be a default gateway for the management network, but what we would do is we would put them in a network, we would plug them in, trunk them, put a bunch of VLANs, and then the device doesn't need a gateway to talk to, to pass traffic back and forth. They use this funky thing that they call auto last hop, which essentially the device will record the layer two address that it received traffic from, 
And then when it goes to respond, or it's, you know, it's passing the load balance traffic back, it'll say, well, I don't have a default gateway in this network. I'm just going to send it to the layer two address that sent it to me. So it's an interesting way of routing without actually needing a router, if you will. And then to be consistent, they have three different names for their uh, self IP ACLs. Um, if you get on the device itself, it's called a self-allow list in the configuration, or it's a self-allow list when you're changing it. When you look in the config file, it's called an allow service in the net, config, in the net self configuration. And then if you go to the GUI, it's called port lockdown. Um, confused yet? <laughs> um, backdoors and web shells. So the thing about these devices, like I said, they run CentOS. Uh, they only have Python 2. I was going to do a whole bunch of cool demos with um, like Impacket and a bunch of other things, and I realized most of the fun hacking tools are written in Python 3 now. Um, the other thing about these devices is they've stripped out all of the stuff that would be useful for you. So there's no compilers. Um, they are CentOS, but they don't have the RPM command, so you couldn't even like grab a Python 3 RPM and just you know install it when you got on there. So if you're going to take post-exploitation tools with you, you're going to need to build them and test them in a lab or in, a, in an F5 VM lab. Make sure that they work, and then you can just drag them over to the device when you actually get onto it. Um, they are mostly CentOS on x86-64. Most of these devices run Intel chips, so it's not really that difficult to do this stuff. It's just it takes some preparation and planning. What they do have, because of the way these devices are set up and because of some of the things that they need to be able to do, is they have a full suite of LDAP tools. So this is, I believe, it's all the standard CentOS stuff. So you've got LDAP tools, you've got SMB client, um, you've got Netcat, ironically. Um, it's cron, your RSA, RC scripts, you've got an SSH uh, daemon. Um, I think they might even have FTP and Telnet on them still. Um, not as a service, just in the daemon itself or the, the client itself. So this brings me to a kind of fun part, uh, which is as I was building this talk, um, I was first I was like, okay, this is cool, and then I don't know if anybody's going to grok this. Mandiant comes out with a report two weeks ago about this threat actor called Unk3524, which they believe is a Russian associated state actor, whose way of getting into networks was hacking into load balancers, SAN devices, conference room cameras, phone systems, all of the devices that run proprietary code where you cannot run EDR. It was almost like they copied my slide for their blog, and I was like so honored. Um, so if you want more information, I, I highly recommend this article. It's super fun. Um, so I noticed as I'm reading this, they're talking about their quiet exit backdoor, which is this modified drop bear SSH um, um, daemon. And this really funny part was I, somebody sent me this while I was building the slides, and I had just finished pocking out a uh, cron entry to build a reverse SSH tunnel on reboot. Now, again, not a red teamer, probably not the most efficient way to do it because I had to you know, generate an SSH shared key, put the private key on my C2 server, and do all this other sort of tomfoolery, but this worked. I was like, okay, I just plopped this in there, I rebooted the device, and then it boots back up and it makes an SSH tunnel back to my C2. Once again, I have to log in with an actual username and password on the device, but again, you red teamers, you can, this is, you can do all of this stuff probably much more um, elegantly than I can. Um, and then the other thing to, to note is if you're going to drop a web shell, um, I believe the web path is like user share, dub, 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 something, uh, they mount the user file system read only. So I've seen a lot of attempts when we were doing IR where there, there's these commands trying to sort of echo a PHP file into the web directory. That's not going to work. Um, the advanced actors have figured this out, and we saw this in 2020. They would, the first thing they would send was a remount command to remount user as read write. Then they'd throw their web shell on there, and then they put it back to read only, so it doesn't look any, it doesn't look um, like anything happened. And that K number is the knowledge base article on F5's website that you can go and find out more about this. There's also a bunch of um, links at the end that you'd, may be useful for you. Um, there's some fun things you can do with network device discovery on these things. So. One of the features that their customers from F5 really love is this concept of cookie persistence. I believe they actually have a patent on this thing. Um, but what it does is you say, okay, I want users to get a cookie that persists them to this specific server, and that way you know, the traffic will work. And the, the concept, too, is if it fails over, because the configuration's the same, you'll, you'll still be rehomed to the very same server because you have the cookie, the device says, oh, I know what server to send you to. So it's, it's actually one of their cooler features. The better part about this feature is you can decode these cookies and you can figure out what the back end sort of IP addressing scheme looks like. Because, and it might be a little hard to read, 
Um, you do a Shodan search for Big IP Server. That's what the cookie is named by default. And then you can actually look in the details of it, and it tells you the pool name inside of the device, and then the, the numeric strings are the IP address, and then the port that it's running on. And I think there's some other piece of detail that I, it's been 10 years since I worked there. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing. If you're, you don't even have access to it yet, you figure, okay, what does the backend server network look like? Um, the other fun thing, like I said, these things are SSL TLS um, um, concentrators. So a lot of places will just not run SSL on the back end. So they'll do it securely on the front, and then everything in the back is clear text. Now, most banks don't do this. They do have the ability to do re-encryption on the back end. So you see like financial institutions and people that are super security aware will re-encrypt. But a lot of people that are like, I have an online commerce website. I'm just going to SSL it in the front and then clear text it in the back, YOLO. Um, so, <laughs> like I said, be careful if you TCP dump, but it is a full-fledged TCP dump. If you start to figure out what server you're going for, just craft a TCP dump string to only pull traffic for that specific system, and then it's far less chance of you getting in trouble. Um, they do remote authentication, so they can authenticate against LDAP, Active Directory, Radius, TACAX. Um, this is all stuff you can see in their config files. So, um, again, TMSH list auth will show you whatever their remote authentication stuff is set up as. Um, if you see an auth source of just an empty parents, it means that it's only using local accounts on the device. Um, if you see anything else, it'll say, you know, type is Active Directory. It'll have the um, SAM, like the, the DN search path. It'll have the SAM account name. Um, I couldn't figure out how to crack the passwords. I think they are using salted um, encryption when they, they do these things. But if you're a password cracker, like, go, like, go to town on it. Um, then TMSH show off will give you users, failed logins, and accounts that have been locked out. I have never seen anybody actually set up a lockout, um, like a login limit on their local the devices. They just kind of leave it as the defaults, and the default does not lock you out after a number of failed attempts. Uh, and then one of the fun things about these is because they deploy them in pairs, they actually have this concept of clustering. So you can deploy three, four, five of these things in a cluster. I don't know why you would. Um, but you can use the exploit, and you could actually like, discover other devices on the network. So let's say somebody forgets and leaves just one interface in a place where you can reach it, and everything else is firewalled off. Well, you can use this you know, list CM device, and it'll show you all of the other devices in the cluster, and then you can go and theoretically laterally move. Um, I'm going to redevelop this talk later in the year and probably try to basically have the device exploit the next device by using the exploit. Say, OK, send this command, use the payload to get to the next device, pull a shell back to me. So it's just how, how, how evil are you? Um, then the GUI runs on 8443 for VMs. So if you're scanning 443 in a network, scan 8443, you might find some virtualized F5s. And then I have showed end queries that I like to throw out there. I like to discover things on the internet when a vulnerability comes out. You can get some of those there. Um, valuable config items, and this is where the beer thing comes in. So this was actually one of the Xbox Live uh, uh, F5 devices. When they decommissioned it, um, they were so happy to have it out of their network, they threw a party, and this turned into the world's most expensive beer tap. You're looking at a $750,000 piece of networking hardware that they ran beer lines through and then encased in a block of ice. Uh, <laughs> Not even joking. And the beer was pretty good. Um, so configuration items are all in slash config. The big IP base conf is your base device and networking. This big IP conf is your shared configuration. The user config is here in big IP user. You'll notice that this is actually the old 2020 payload pulling out the, uh, the user information, which is kind of ugly. And then this was the new one from 2022, which is cool because it's JSON. So it actually comes out formatted, and it looks beautiful. And then TMSH list auth user will give you hashes. The hashes are not in the config. Uh, config file store, this is where all the configuration SSL certs, keys, all the juicy stuff that these devices can have is stored in there. Uh, config GTM, uh, we don't have time to go into the DNS side of these things, but if they're doing DNS load balancing and you can get root on one of these, you can imagine all the evil things you can do. It's all in config GTM. Uh, you can also do what I would prefer to tell you to do is do a TMSH, save the UCS, which is the config backup. It's just a tar GZ file that they, taught, they renamed to .ucs. Save it, download it, rename to TGZ, unpack it. You have every valuable file that the device has, and you can go through it without as much risk of getting caught. Um, so how to build a test lab. Um, this, is, uh, this is what I did. So they give away virtual edition uh, VMs for free for all your major hypervisors, right? So we got KVM, Hyper-V, um, VMware. Uh, they also give away vulnerable versions. 
So the version that I was running was vulnerable to the 2020 CVE. It turns out it was also vulnerable, of course, to the 2022 CVE, but it's cool if you figure out what, your, what version it's on, just download that version and now you can start messing around with it. I thought you would delete vulnerable versions of code from your repositories, but they don't. Um, like I said, this is how you test your toys. Uh, and they want, if you want to do load balancing, like actually license it, you need a 30-day demo license. You can use a throwaway email to get one of these. Like, they don't check to see if it's a valid, like a, like a legitimate company. You just go to like throwaway mail or any of those sites. You, can get, you set up an account, ask for registration keys. They give you a set of three. They're good for 30 days. You can do this as many times as you want. I think I generated 30 of them in the process of testing this lab. Um, I use Proxmox. This screenshot is actually the, the config from my Proxmox server. It's very complicated and finicky to get this working. If you have problems, see me afterwards. Um, you can also run these in clouds, Azure, AWS, virtualized instances, same process for a demo license, except you also now have to pay for cloud computing time. Up to you. And then you can download ISOs too, the same thing with a throwaway account. So if you'd like to pull apart ISOs and look at all the stuff that's installed and see if there's old packages that you can exploit, you can do that too. Uh, don't buy them off eBay. If you buy it off eBay, you will not be able to use it until you have a valid support contract from F5, which costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a year. And if you're interested in doing any of this stuff, I'm happy to help you with research. Find me later. Hit me up on Twitter. And with that, your reference material is here. I will be posting these slides to my GitHub later on today. Um, like I said, come find me. And um, thank you very much. And like I said, I mentioned I was a DJ. This is me 20 years ago before the beard. I promise I wasn't born with this thing. Um, I have a SoundCloud because it's what you do. And thank you very much, NorthSec.